Testing. All right, if we can go ahead and grab a seat, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I mentioned to you that if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 26 through 49. And I was planning on this last, uh, to do this message next week, but in light of everything that's happening that's coming up, um, I felt it would be better to do it this week. Um, but there's just a lot that's happening, not only in our world with the hurricane here and all the stuff there, but then the election that's coming up and all the dividing of the people that's taken place and, and what do we do in the midst of, what do we do in the midst of this, um, you know, election season? And then at the end of the message, I want to address a particular amendment that is on the Florida ballot that I want to discuss and make you aware of. But Daniel chapter 2 is a, a good reminder for us as Christians. And we're going to, if you have your Bibles, like I said, turn there. And um, in this story on Daniel, we have... Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, has a dream. And the dream is very disturbing, uh, very disturbing for him. And so what Nebuchadnezzar does is he then tells all of his wise men, all of these, um, you know, so-called dream interpreters, all these men that he had a disturbing dream and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what my dream was, what I dreamt, and then I want you to interpret it. And of course, they could not do it. They said, King, nobody can do this. No, this is totally impossible. And he's like, well, how do I know that the interpretation that you're going to give me to the dream is true if you can't tell me what the dream was? And so they could not do it, so he ends up killing most of them. And in the process, Daniel is, quote, one of these wise men that are there. And so the king of the guard, or the, guard, uh, the head of the guard, comes to Daniel, and he says, give me, a, give me a day, let's pray. He calls the brothers together, and they pray. And he says, okay, take me to the king. And uh, this is what we have the interpretation uh, so in Daniel chapter 2, that is where he begins to thank God. You'll see in verse, uh, verse 19, it says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed God, the God of heaven, and Daniel answered. And then he begins to give praise to God. And we're going to see Daniel's through this process. And so we're going to look at this dream that Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar and then the interpretation to that dream and then really how it applies to us today in the 21st century because it does, rightly so. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God, which is true. We thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that your kingdom will reign forever. And so, Lord, I just ask, God, that you give us grace and wisdom today as we unpack this passage from a book written well over 700, 800 years ago, but still applies to us today. And so, Father, I thank you for that, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. Have you ever had a dream that you woke up that was very disturbing for you? Uh, I don't know about you, but I've w woken up from dreams in the past, at times even blurting out something, and then blurting out something has woken me up, and then I just laugh it off and think, oh man, that was a good one. Anybody 
have anything like that? Thank you, both of you. That raised your hand. You made me feel comforted that I'm not alone and crazy. Well, as I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, what are the, what is the science behind dreams? And is there a science behind it? And is, what do people think about their dreams? And so I just did a Google search real quick and I read a couple articles and it was well over 60% of the people that dream believe that their dream have significant meaning for their life. And uh, I just found it interesting just reading all the different statistics of how people view and inter interpret their dream, both in their present life and in the future, things that are going to happen. And one of the things I know, I know that God does give us dreams and visions. I have no problems with that. I think that happens today. Matter of fact, uh, if you ever talk to uh, someone who was a Muslim, most Muslims today, what's happening in the Muslim world today is they're having dreams and visions of Jesus, and they're coming to faith in Christ. You can read about it and see what God's doing in the midst of this, but for whatever reason, they tend to get revelation, dreams, visions along those lines. Well, for Nebuchadnezzar, it was like that. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and it was very disturbing. He could not sleep. He needed this dream revealed, and he needed it interpreted. And so what we have seen here is that Daniel goes to God and prays, and we read here in verse 19 that God has given Daniel the revelation to the dream, and Daniel worships God for it. And so the uh, chief guard takes Daniel before the king, and he takes him, it says in verse 25, it says, he takes Daniel before the king in haste. He's like, I don't want to kill you. I'm tired of killing guys. So we're going to get you in front of the king as fast as we can. And so he puts him in front of the king and he says, I have found among the exiles from Judah, a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. Verse 26, the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Daniel answered to the king, and I love this here. I want you to look at really Daniel's humility. I want you to see Daniel's humility. But before we dive into this, I want us to see our, my focus point today is simply this. The kingdom of man is temporary but the kingdom of God is eternal. The kingdom of man is temporary, but the kingdom of God is eternal. And so this is what Daniel says in his humility. He says, Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven. Amen? Amen? I love that. I love what Daniel's doing here. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But once again, look at David's, or, uh, Daniel's humility. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You, O king, uh, you saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was fine gold, and its chest uh, and arms of silver, and the middle and thighs of bronze. Its legs were iron, and its feet were partly iron and partly clay. 
As you looked, a stone cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell you, O king, its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, small k, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory into whose hand he has given whoever they dealt, the children of man, the beast of the fields and the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth and there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things and like iron that crushes it, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, shall be a divided kingdom, but some of firmness of iron shall it be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom of God shall be partly strong, or so the kingdom, not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break into pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw a stone that was cut out from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made this known to you, king. What shall be after this? The dream is certain and its interpretation, sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and the commander and, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered to David said, truly your God is God of all gods, the Lord of all kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Folks, what an incredible story, huh? This live thing taking place, recorded for us in the book of Daniel, that we can look back at history and see Daniel's prophecy coming true. We see Daniel's humility in giving God the glory for all that he has done in the midst of this, saying that it is not him, there's nothing that I have, not because of any wisdom that I have all along the living, but so that you can know that this God that I serve is the one who can interpret dreams. And this God is going to reveal these dreams to you, Nebuchadnezzar, so that you can have peace in your mind and know what is about to take place. And so what we have here is we see that Daniel, uh, that God reveals the dream to Daniel. And basically this is what this image of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, the head and shoulders are the head uh, as of gold. Then you see the, um, the silver and then the bronze and then the iron. 
and then the feet of clay with iron and clay mixed together. So it's going to be a strong and weak kingdom. Now, the things that we do know, that we can look at this image, and what Daniel said is that each one of them, we can look back in the past because of where we live now, and we can see these four dominating kingdoms of what Daniel is talking about. And so it's broken down here into this. So here's the statue. So the head of gold, we know for sure who that is. That is Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. We know that because that's what Daniel says. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are that head of gold. Now, the remaining kingdoms that come, Daniel probably wasn't alive when these things, because you have the fall of Daniel. Then what you have, you have the chest and the arms right here. I use my little pointer. The chest and the arms of silver. This is the Medes and the Persians. This is the second kingdom, great kingdom, that comes after Babylon. And so they ruled and reigned. Nobody, none of them ruled and reigned like Babylon, had the territory like Babylon did. And that's why he says, you are the gold. You're the one and everybody else who comes after you is inferior. So Babylon was like the greatest kingdom of all that we have. And so here you come with the Medes and the Persian, then the belly and thighs, our belly and thighs of bronze. That's Greece. Okay, that's Alexander the Great. He went and conquered all the lands from the Medes and the Persians. He built his kingdom up all along the lines here. It's got dates for you. You can look all this stuff up. You can read about the history of it. These are three of the four great kingdoms that come. And then obviously the one, the last kingdom, the legs of iron is what? Rome. Rome. This is during the time of the writing of the New Testament. They were the last. Rome was the last great dominating kingdoms of the world. I mean, Rome was huge. It was, we know that the, with the abilities of why Jesus came, when, when you look at history and you say, okay, when Jesus came, why did Jesus come during the time of the Romans and not during in the 21st century where he could have social media and he could do all this stuff? No, the the reason why Jesus came at the time he came was it was perfect. Koine Greek was like a common language among all people because of the Roman Empire and its spread. You had some Greek influence from Greece, obviously, and different things along these lines. But Rome was really the last of the great empires, okay? Now, there have been people who tried to make great empires since Rome. I mean, you can say Hitler tried, you can say uh, Mao tried, you can try all these different dictators that we have seen throughout history tried to bring about world dominance on their own, but have failed. So we see these four great kingdoms of what is laid out, everything that goes, but each one of these kingdoms eventually fade. They all eventually die or somebody, another king comes and overtakes them and overpowers them and then takes over all the land, all the things that take place. Now, the part that is, quote, hasn't happened yet, these things are the, the feet. The feet, which are iron and clay mixed, okay? And the toes are clay and iron mixed. Now, it just depends on who you're listening to. These, you know, when you get into the end time stuff, people are looking like, okay, what does that look like? And is America one of these 10 nations because of the 10 toes? Is America one of these 10 where the iron and the clay together? And so you got all these guys on television telling you how it's going to happen and how America's one of the 10 and you got this and this and this and this, and you've got this whole thing going on and, and Guys are making a lot of money telling you about where America is in this. I don't know where America is. I don't even know if America's in this. Don't know. They don't either. They're making speculation that it is, but it doesn't tell us who these 10 are. Now, we, there's speculation. Could it be the European Common Union, you know, with the euro? Because there's 15 nations there. Are five of those nations going to be overtaken by the others and they'll become 10. And so therefore we're all going to, you know, be this and that or whatever and going to have the Euro for the rest of our life. I don't know. Is America part of that? 
We don't know. We don't have any clues to this. We can try to match it up, and people do. But my point and my focus for today is simply this, folks, is that there is another kingdom coming, okay? There is this, there is this stone right here that's going to come, and it's going to crush these toes it's going to crush the legs. It's going to crush the thighs of bronze, the chest of and arms of silver and of gold. There is a kingdom that we as believers, this world, folks, is not our home. Man, that was weak. Yeah. This world is not our home. Okay. We like, like, Daniel was exiled. Daniel was a slave. Daniel was taken from Judah and brought to Babylon and was begin trained in his ways. You know the story of Daniel and his, and his friends and they didn't eat the king's meats and all these different things. And Daniel then has this revelation from God and he's elevated to all the stuff that's happening and that's coming forward in the midst of this in the midst of this evil debauchery of a nation called Babylon, world dominance, Daniel is living in the midst of that because he's an exile. See, you and I as Christians, we're exiles too. We're, we're, we've been exiled here, but this is not our home. Our home is heaven, and we long for heaven, and we say, there's going to be Jesus who will be the light and everything that we sang about earlier today. And that's the home that we long for just as much as Daniel longed for his home in Israel and Judah of where he was. He knew that he was in exile. He knew what was going to take place. And we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end. And so you and I, we cannot look at and see all of the things. Look, my hope is in Jesus Christ and what he's doing. Because just as much as God was in charge of Nebuchadnezzar, God is in charge of the United States. And it is God who appoints men and kings. Look at what we see here in verse 36. Look at what Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar. He says this, you, O king, the king of kings, small k, to whom the God of heaven has given you the kingdom. God has given you this kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. You did not earn it. You did not come in here and somehow do something, but God has orchestrated the plan to where you, Nebuchadnezzar, are this king. I've given you all authority and all power. And so this is where you and I as Christians today, we, that we, can, we can find peace in our soul as we're moving forward to an election that is going to take place. Voting starts here pretty soon, early voting in Florida. But on November 5th is when that date of the election will be finalized. You and I can rest today knowing that no matter who wins, God is still in control. Amen. Yeah. Okay. And that's the hope that we have. Why? Because our kingdom, our hope, is not of this world. Our home is in heaven, but while we're exiled here, we're going to do everything that we can, and I'll get into that in a moment as well, to make sure that righteousness still prevails. Because you can take this mindset, and some Christians do, is that, well, heaven is, heaven is my home. I'm just an exile. I'm not going to do anything to make a difference in the world in which we live. That's a wrong approach to take. And we're going to see that from Scripture here in just a moment. But I want you to see where he says this. He, that's why Daniel lets you know, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and the might and the glory. God has done this, Nebuchadnezzar, not you. I'm about to reveal to you the dream from this king of heaven. I'm about to tell you what your dream is and its interpretation, and you're going to know. And that's what, look at King Nebuchadnezzar's response when he's done. Look, what king is going to bow down to an exiled Jewish man unless God is at work? And that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. Then, look at verse 46, then after he tells him this, 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering be given to him. But then he answered Daniel and said, Truly your God, capital G, is God, capital G, of all gods, small g, and the Lord, capital L, of kings, small kings, small k, and a revealer of mystery. You see, that's the purpose of why we live in in an exiled land. Our purpose is to bring glory to God, to be used by God in the land in which we live to bring glory to him, to be a revealer of mysteries, to, to be people, not only a revealer of mysteries, and our mystery that we were revealing is Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel that there is no other way for man to be saved except through Jesus Christ, Period. And that's the word of God. That's Jesus saying these things. That ain't me saying these things. This is Jesus saying this, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, our world may not like that answer, but hey, then you gotta talk to Jesus about it. Don't yell at me. All I am is don't kill the messenger, right? I'm just the messenger to tell you what has taken place. That's our responsibility in the exiled land that we live now. Look, I'm, I'm gonna vote. I've always voted. I let you know I'm a super voter. I'm one of those, I vote for everything and anything. That's our responsibility that I believe we have as Christians. But ultimately, my faith is not in America. My faith is not in any president. Look. I want it, but it doesn't matter who's in office. As long as they're printing money, we're going to have problems. And all they do is print money, print more money, and the dollar value goes up. And pretty soon, it, it's just going to be crazy. I mean, I, I can walk around in Colombia with a million pesos in my hands. And that may be a dollar. American money. That's how inflation and the, when you continue to print money and you continue to print money and you don't live under a balanced budget, imagine you not living on a balanced budget. You think your creditors are going to let you live that way? No way. Only problem is you don't have the ability to print money. You can, it's called counterfeiting, but you would go to jail for that. But the U.S. government has the ability to print money and print money and print money and no one wants to stop it and nobody's going to run on a balanced budget. So we're going to have problems. It's just going to come. I'm not being prophetic. I'm just letting you know, right? You just know when you spend more than you bring in, you got issues. And there's only one way to solve it. And the way the U.S. government solves it is by printing more money, which devalues the dollar and then goes on. But anyway, we're getting back to Daniel here. But I want you to see in Daniel chapter, chapter 2, look at verse 21. Because I've told you that it is, Daniel tells the king, it's the God of heaven who has given you this. He's given you the ability. He's given you the power. He's given you the might. He's given you the glory. And look what Daniel 2.21 says. He says this, he changes the times and the seasons He removes kings and sets up kings. That's what God does. This is Daniel in his, what he's saying, look at the verse before, because Daniel has been revealed, the dream has been revealed to him. Daniel's giving praise to God, and this is what the praise is. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. David's given or Daniel's given God all the glory for that because he sees what the interpretation to the dreams is. So he's saying, yeah, God takes, raises kings up and he takes kings down. There's a season for this. It's going to happen. And Daniel sees it in the dream with each phase of the way. He understands that Babylon is the head. He's got all this stuff coming in. He sees this and he thanks God for it. Proverbs 21.1 says this, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. God is always in control of everything, 
And then a passage of scripture that we have got to understand and see is Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That's why it doesn't matter who's president. That's why we're called as Christians to pray for our president. We're called to lift them up. So we prayed a couple of weeks back. We pray for Joe Biden. We pray and we pray for Kamala Harris and for Donald Trump. And we ask, oh God, please, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we want the person we want in office, but then ultimately, Lord, we're going to trust you knowing that your hand is on this nation. You will lead it and you're going to guide it just like you did Babylon, just like you did Israel. Your hand guided them and led them all along the way to what? To fulfill your purpose. Here on earth. And so no matter what happens, I know my hair is gray, but if I didn't believe that God was sovereign over all things, my hair would be pulled out because of the nonsense that's going on in our world. And it would be worse. I mean, I'd just have patches being pulled out all the time, but you know what? I sleep good at night. You know why I sleep good at night? Because I trust in a sovereign God. I know my God is greater than any president, any king, any kingdom. My God is there. He's alive. He's on the throne. He's working in conjunction and he will fulfill his purpose with the United States of America. He will fulfill his purpose in me and my responsibilities to proclaim the gospel because the kingdom that I'm a part of is an eternal kingdom. My kingdom is the rock that is going to come down from heaven, a rock, and we'll get into in just a moment, that has been not carved out by human hands, as Daniel says, but this rock is Jesus Christ, and he's going to come back as that stone, and he's going to crush those feet, and everything will bow down in pieces to him, and that kingdom will be an eternal kingdom. Man, that's just good preaching right there, brothers. And so that's the hope that we have. This is what we see. This is what is going on in our nation as we watch this unfold before us. Jesus Christ, he is the one. He is the one that has come, as Daniel says. He says, just as you saw that stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke into the pieces of iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made it known to the king what shall be after this. This dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. I'm, I'm positive of this, folks. Daniel, if the God of heaven is revealing this to Daniel, and Nebuchadnezzar falls down and worships the God that Daniel's worshiping, and when Daniel says, this interpretation is certain and sure, You can know, folks, that we got a kingdom that's coming, that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is the stone. He is the stone. Look what Jesus says himself in Luke chapter um, 17 and 18. Jesus says this about himself. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken into pieces. And when, it fa- and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus is this stone that the builders rejected. He is this stone that is going to come and crush the kingdom of this world. Every kingdom. Doesn't matter who's in charge. Doesn't matter if America is part of this 10 nation thing or not. When Jesus comes, he's going to crush every nation and every kingdom, and the kingdom of God will live and reign eternally. So we have this promise. This promise is sure that every kingdom of man, the kingdom of man, that statue represents the kingdom of man. That rock represents the kingdom of God. The kingdom of man is passing away. 
But the kingdom of God is eternal and will remain forever. And what do you think when we look at that? Let's, let's just follow the words of Jesus with his disciples. His disciples are living in a Roman kingdom. You see, he, here's the thing that what can happen to us sometimes as Americans, okay? Is that we can want to live back in the old glory days. If, if, if we can just get this person in office, then these days are glorious, going to be wonderful and beautiful, and, and it's just going to be utopia. And I'm, I'm telling you, we live in a fallen, sinful world. Look, I want things to be better for all of us. I don't want inflation sky high. I don't want to continue to pay the prices that I'm paying for a number of things. I think there's things that we can do by putting the right person in office that can take care of that. But that's not my hope. You remember when, when Jesus um, is resurrected and he shows up to the disciples in Acts chapter 1. Jesus comes to um, his disciples. He shows up and he says, hey guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to empower you and you're going to be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So he tells them to go and wait for the Holy Spirit. And you know what the question is that the disciples asked Jesus? Anyone know? They asked this question. Jesus, is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I mean, Jesus is telling them to go and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come. And their first question is like, hey, Jesus, are you now coming to overthrow the Roman government? Are you now coming and, and going to set up the nation of Israel of what it used to be and all of his glory and, and the nation of Israel back when David had it and back when Solomon had it and everybody came and watched Solomon and the, uh, the queen of Sheba comes into Israel and looks at Solomon and says, man, look at the beautiful things that you've done and created. Your God is a wonderful God. Is, is Israel going to be restored? And sadly, we have Christians have that same mindset. Can, can we get back to where America was? Can we get back? Folks, we're not going back to where it was. We'll never have it. We're too far in debt to have it. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's coming. Get ready. Now, can it get better than what it is now? Yes. Do I want it to? Yes. But I'm sitting here saying, if your hope is in this kingdom of man, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if your hope is in the kingdom of God, and then you're working for the kingdom of God, then we go after it. And that's why Jesus says, look, I wanted to follow the words of Jesus. He said, look, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek that kingdom first. That's the kingdom I want and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to me. That's what Jesus is telling them in Matthew 6. Don't worry about what you eat or what you're going to drink. The Gentiles worry about these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things are going to be added unto you. Now, we as Christians can make an impact in the world in which we live. We are exiles in a foreign land. Our home is heaven. But while we are here, we are to do what God has called us to do. So I'm going to look at my last point, which is this, Daniel's reward. Daniel's reward is simply this. Not only does Nebuchadnezzar come down and bow down to him and tell him about what a great God he is, Daniel gets high honors. He, he's get, the king is showering gifts on him because he understands what Daniel has done. And what Daniel, God has done for him. And so what does he do? He makes Daniel the ruler over a whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And then Daniel makes a request for the king. And he says, oh, king, can I have my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and can they be a part of this? And king says, whatever you want, Daniel, you got it. And so now these exiled children of God are now ruling in a pagan nation. I mean, how crazy is that, right? 
I mean, why didn't Daniel come up and say, I don't want any of your trash, Nebuchadnezzar. I don't want your money. I don't want your, uh, all the positions in government. This government is evil. This government is all these things. This government is, is going to hell. That's where this government's going to do. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to do anything. No, that wasn't their mindset. Daniel was there and he got his friends involved to have Christians, quote, in government. And so there they are ruling. Daniel is ruling over all the wise men of Babylon. He's made him, he's in the, the last line is this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were handled the affairs of the providence of Babylon. But Daniel, Daniel was in the king's court. Daniel was right there next to Nebuchadnezzar. And so we have these people that live in America today. I don't want anything to do with this world. Don't want to get involved in government. Don't want to get involved in politics. Don't want to do this. Don't want to do that. No, while we're exiles, we are to do this. So question, why did Daniel do this? Why did he get involved with this evil government? Go with me to Jeremiah 29 real quick. <clears throat> Many of you know Jeremiah 29, 11. You have it. Probably on your, it's your promise that you have, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, who knows it? Anybody can say it? I know the plans I have for you, right? Everybody, we quote that verse, don't we? You got to look at the context of that verse. So uh, verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Yeah, that's a wonderful verse that we can have. <laughs> But this is coming from Jeremiah. You got to read verses 1 through 10 to appreciate verse 11, okay? So Jeremiah is still in Judah. Jeremiah, so all of the children of, of Israel, not all of them, but the, the ones that the Babylonians chose, such as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and others, they were taken from Judah and to Babylon. But there were still those that were left. And those that were left, one of them was Jeremiah, the prophet. And so what Jeremiah does is he's praying and he's asking God about the exiles in Babylon. Lord, are those people going to come home? When are they going to come back to us? What are we going to do? And so what does Jeremiah do? God gives Jeremiah a word. And so this, look at verse 4 of Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I, God, have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay, catch that? God is the one. He didn't send everybody. He sent those exiles into Babylon. Specifically, for sure we know, he sent Daniel to Babylon to interpret his dream. He was going to use Daniel. To all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now look what he tells them to do. This is God telling them. The children of God in the midst of a pagan, godless, polytheistic culture. This is what God tells them to do. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare and you will find welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I do not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are complete in Babylon, are when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore you your fortunes and gather you from all nations and all places where I have driven you declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from whence I sent you into exile. Folks, this, just as much as it was a prophecy for the children of Israel that have been exiled into Babylon, so this is our mandate as well for us. We are exiles in a foreign land We need to pray for the welfare of this city and of this nation. Amen? Pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare, for you will find your welfare. Don't listen to the false prophets' dreams. Don't worry about interpreting whether or not America is going to be one of the toes or not on the big last final stage. Folks, let's pray that the kingdom of God would come to earth, that God would move and show himself and pray for our nation and pray for the people of America and ask God for mercy and grace and let's have children, let's build houses, let's go and do things in this earth that we live for the glory of God because our kingdom is coming. Our king is coming. He won't be president of the United States, but he will be the king over all the world. That's Jesus Christ. And he's the one that we look to. So yeah, am I going to vote? Yes. Am I going to be on the forefront out there encouraging you to vote? Yes. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that people are doing their responsibility as citizens of the United States, this God-given gift that we have to vote, not just for president, but for other things that are coming along. And so when we do this, this is how we get involved. This is what we do when we say, hey, Lord, please, Jesus, Jeremiah 29, this is where we're at. And so let's get involved. And so one thing, a couple things here, related to this is I told y'all I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'll be wrapping up here soon. Let me see the time. I don't want to. Yeah. We have the candidate candidate guides for you in the foyer on the table. This right here, this gives you the position of on the president side and then on the U S Senate side, Rick Scott. And then, um, Debbie Powell is running against him. That gives you this. On the back is the amendments for the state of Florida. Uh, I would encourage you to read this. I would encourage you to do your own research on these amendments and then vote according to your conscience. Okay? This is what I want you to do. But it's here for you as a guide. Like I said, it's in the back. Take one per family. Uh, You can look it up. I can give it to you, whatever, but I have copies in the back, not at the table, but in the back in the foyer that are there. But there is an amendment. There's two of them that I'm very concerned about, but Amendment 4 is the one I'm most uh, worried about. Now, for those that don't know, with the Florida, um, when you have amendments, these are amendments that are going on to the constitutions of the state of Florida. These are constitutional amendments. So if these things, and to get onto the Constitution, you have to have 60% of the vote in order for it to be a constitutional amendment. Uh, Can the the federal government override it? Sure, they did it. Uh, When we, back in the day, when we looked at marriage and we voted on the constitutional amendment, uh, marriage between a man and a uh, a woman, that that's how we looked at man, uh, marriage, we viewed marriage as between a man and a woman. That's what 62% of Floridians that voted on that amendment voted for that. So overwhelmingly it was voted, put on the amendment Uh, that that's how the state of Florida would recognize marriage. 
That's when the federal government got involved and the Supreme Court overruled all amendments pertaining to that and their view that was that marriage can be between anybody, whoever you want to. They, don't, they didn't define what marriage was. And so therefore, you got people marrying their pets and you got this person and you know, it's not just one, I want to marry three people, all of that other stuff you got going on. But that, that, the government overrode that, okay? Overrode that amendment. When the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, it gave the rights back to the states when it comes to the issue of abortion. And so this amendment is in light of that. I will be sending to you a video that you can watch because this is a very dangerous amendment. It is only 34 words long, and it is very concerning, okay? Because they do not define, most amendments are like pages long. They have just a short, short paragraph that's on the amendment that you read, but normally they define the terms. They define the terms when you read the rest of the amendments, okay? So this amendment is this. You can read it here on the back and it's in the front. I've got this in the back for you as well. Do your own research on these things. I'm just going to share, you, share with you some of my concerns with this amendment. Okay? Here is the summary of the amendment. No law. Okay, first of all, they started it out, which I thought was brilliant. They started out with amendment to limit government interference. Now, whenever you say that, I, you get my attention. I don't want government involved. Okay? I mean, I'm like right there with you. But then this is where they get you to limit government interference with abortion, okay? And it says this, no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by a patient's healthcare provider. This amendment does not change the legislature constitutional authority to require notification to a parent or guarding before a minor has an abortion, okay? So that is, in essence, the amendment. Here's my concern with this, because they do not define the terms. I went last Sunday night to hear Mark Mink speak, did a wonderful job at um, Westside Baptist, was able to hear him explain this, got it very good, watched a couple of other videos on this, watched what the... What, what the people are that are voting for this amendment, what they're saying and voting against this amendment. And they're saying the same thing. I'm watching commercials on television and watching the commercials absolutely lie in on this. Those that are voting, say vote yes on this, they're absolutely lying there because they use phrases that this new, that the law that governor DeSantis has passed says no exceptions. And they said, there's no exceptions. Yes, there are. You just go read the law. There's six different exceptions to where it comes in here. Rape, incest, uh, sexual trafficking, and the other two, I can't remember off the top of my head what they are. But they just flat out lie in the ad when it said, no doctors, no exceptions, rape, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that is a bold-faced lie on this stuff. That's why you can't trust what you see in media, folks, okay? You just can't trust it. Got to do the research yourself. But when it says that no shall all shall put before viability, they do not define viability, what that means. That means before viability is whatever you want it to be. It could mean you could terminate that child in the ninth month of your pregnancy. They don't define what viability is. Roe versus Wade defined viability. Roe versus Wade said it was 24 to 28 weeks was viability. They don't even define that. There's nothing in there when you break it down and it tells you viability is this. And so that means that you're going to be able to, if this passes, it will override every state law that we have on the books pertaining to abortion when it comes to this, meaning that you're going to be able to. Then the second one is this, to protect a patient's health. What is that? They don't define what the patient's health is. So if somebody comes up and said, man, I... I'm having mental illness because I'm pregnant. Well, that means that, it, that they can do whatever reasons that you want. They don't define what a patient's health is. If, it, if it's going to kill the mom, if it's got, these are all the exceptions that they have. 
And then it says this, as determined by that patient's health care provider. Okay? It doesn't say according to the patient's doctor. It says health care provider. Do you know who a health care provider is? A health care provider is a guy that can give you a tattoo. You go look up what Florida statute says a health care provider is. It's someone who's a nursing school at the University of Florida. It can be anyone. And so this amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent. It eliminates parental consent. They can notify you after your child has had an abortion. They're going to notify. We're going to notify the parent, but we're going to notify the parent when it's done not to get their consent to do it. So I would encourage you, this is just a brief summary Pick this up, read it. I will send you other information as well. Pick this up. And folks, we just got to be involved. The reason why I wanted to do the message this week is because Dev, tomorrow is the last day to register to be able to vote in the upcoming election. If I would have spoke on this message last week, you wouldn't have been able to. If you're not a registered voter, please go and register to vote. If you don't want to vote for the president, then that's fine. Don't vote for anything, but vote against this. Okay? Vote against Amendment 4 and look at it that way. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message today. We thank you that you are in control of all things. Your kingdom will come. And so, Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.